level one. It doesn't matter what it is. Like I'm starting out level one now. I've been in real estate for a little bit. I'm doing the podcasting. I'm doing the influencer stuff. Uh, I love coaching. I love teaching. I love sharing my passion because my passion is driving my love now, not that pain before that sent me into a bad spot. So what it is is that I operated at a level seven in the major leagues, mm -hmm. and that, that, that was my ceiling. Like I wasn't really that good. I was a two-time all-star third baseman, and I had no clue how to field a ground ball. I'm like the worst infielder in the world but I knew how to implement a process. Hey, welcome everybody. It's your host, Brad Blazer here. We're back on Beast Nation and we've got a great day today. As many of you know, I've really been committed in focusing on what I call kind of discovering how to create the mindset of a champion. And that all came about a few weeks ago when I hosted the former performance coach to the New York Yankees, Dana Cavalier. And today I'm so excited because I'm hosting another big time superstar in Major League Baseball, Shea Hillebrand, who, you know, played at the college level, was uh, drafted by the Boston Red Sox, spent seven years and is now doing great things in his life. So Shea, welcome to Beast Nation, buddy. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a super honored for this opportunity to share with you. Uh, the Beast Nation family of yours. <laughs> it's a big family, man. You're, you're global today. So, you know, <laughs> I want to really get started by, number one, getting my audience to know who Shea Hillebrand is. And, you know, you and I, of course, spoke before I got to know a little bit about your past and how you always had this dream and this vision, even as a little kid, about, you know, playing uh, Major League Baseball. But kind of unpack your backstory so people kind of know a little bit about your past and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, I'll take uh, your listeners or your viewers on a little bit of a journey of the life of Shea Hillenbrand. And if you Google my name, uh, hopefully I'll give you a different perspective now uh, of who I am and why, they, why I did the things I did uh, so people could kind of like, kind of relate. But uh, I grew up in Southern California uh, in a little town called, called Arcadia where the Santa Anita racetrack is, if you're a horse lover, uh, just off the 210 east of uh, L.A. Diehard Dodger fan. And uh, I'd always go to the Dodger games. Uh, I'd always be at the top deck uh, uh, of Dodger Stadium, Chavez Ravine. Uh, my mom would take myself and my best friend, and uh, I'd sit there with my nachos in one hand and my chocolate milk in my other hand, and I'd always envision myself playing on the Major League Baseball field. Uh, so right there is, is kind of like where my journey began, like in an indirect, unconscious way, uh, making my dream become true. Yeah. Because uh, I would sit at the top deck and I'd make, I would engage all my senses and, I, and I'd do everything I could to, to make that dream of mine as a kid to become a major league baseball player tangible uh, mm -hmm. from seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. Uh, I'd hear the crack of the bat, roar the crowd, uh, the smell of the grass, you know, the, the baseball gloves. And I always envisioned myself being announced by Vince Scully uh, because he was the godfather of baseball for L.A. Dodgers fans. Sure. Uh, now, now batting number 29, Shea Hillenbrand. So I really didn't care too much about uh, the players. Uh, proven that, my, my favorite player was Steve Sachs, second baseman. Uh, he was an underdog. He couldn't even throw the ball to first base. So uh, proven that, that I never got autographs. I never, I never did any of that such. I just always envisioned myself being on that field. So when I leave the stadium after a game, uh, we'd always uh, show up in the third, leave in the seventh, uh, listen to Vince Scully on the radio to beat L.A. traffic. That's the consistency of a diehard Dodger fan <laughs> in the 1980s. So that's all I knew. So I would go home and lay in bed at night, and I would engage that RAS, you know, my reticular activating system from a very young age uh, to where I think a lot of kids do that. But life kind of happens and makes their dreams go dormant. And I was so obsessed to be able to achieve uh, what I wanted to achieve as a major league baseball player that I never let anything get in my way. So as I was laying there at night, uh, I, would envision, I would envision the same things that went over my head uh, as I was at that stadium experiencing that, engaging all of my senses. So as we all know, you know, your mind can't discern the difference between imagination and reality. So that was the reason why I touched on that, because I think it's an integral part of somebody trying to achieve their dream, somebody trying to uh, – makes their dream or whatever they're trying to set out to do, their vision, their goals come to fruition is, is you have to engage at RS. So uh, it, it's so interesting you say that because I uh, hosted a guy last year that, you know, is a superstar coach. This guy became a multimillionaire, retired in his thirties and went on a journey of self-development. I mean, this guy literally studied with the best, the best people like Jack Canfield, people like Covey, people like Tony Robbins. I mean, he literally, 
now has worked alongside Tony Robbins for like the last 16 years. And what he said to me was amazing. He said, Brad, he said the two most powerful words in the entire English language are actually two of the smallest. And I sat there and I said, what are they? He said, the two words are I am. And what I see here, Shay, for you is from the day you were probably four or five years old is you kept saying, I am a major league baseball player. I am a major league baseball player. And what it did is it manifested itself into your life. You became one and, and you were able to live your dream. And like you said, so many kids, that dream wanes. You know, life takes a turn of events, shit happens or whatever. And you obviously just pursued it. And it's so funny because when I was interviewing Dana, he had exactly the same dream. I mean, he would literally peek through, you know, the fences when he was down in Florida, you know, when obviously the Yankees were down there in spring training and just dreaming one day of being out there on the ball field. And he went to college, played ball in school. And then it was really funny down in Florida, the coach basically of the college said, Hey, you know, the Yankees are in town. They're looking for basically an intern, but you know, the job of an intern is you're going to be, you know, carrying around the wet towels and, you know, really just, uh, you know, walking around the locker room, picking up the weights. He's like, you know, you want to do this? Like, hell yeah. <laughs> you know, and before yeah. you knew it, he became the performance coach, of the Yankees, because he now already had one foot in the door and it just continued making that dream a, a vision. Now, let me ask you, you know, obviously when you're playing at that level, there's a different mindset, and we talked about this, where really for you, being a major league ball player kind of defined your life. It, it kind of became your reality, and then after, you know, seven years, you realized really there was a disconnect. There was a conflict in, in what you thought it was going to be and what it actually became. Can you kind of unpack that for us? Yeah, yeah, definitely I could do that, and uh, uh, it didn't really happen after seven years. It's kind of like where I had like an aha moment or, or a moment of despair, but uh, it pretty much happened my whole career, so uh, I really didn't have a, a really solid relationship with my father, and a lot of, a lot of boys and men, you know, kind of share that same issue with uh, living up to, to the expectations that we perceive uh, of, of our father wanting us to be, because that's our first male role model in our life is our father, so... Uh, all the way through, I was always, you know, really successful at, at a very young age. I was always one of the better players. But uh, uh, at 14 years old, my father came in the room. This was right before uh, my sophomore year of high school. And this is like right, finish, we finished junior high. Uh, ninth grade was still junior high, going into high school. Formative years of my life, of a young teenager's life. And, and he just walks in. I'm getting ready to go to high school. I already went to the baseball camp, all that stuff for the high school. Standout star, all, you know, working my tail off because – because every time that my friends were, like, hanging out and relaxing, I was working. I was throwing a ball against the wall. I never listened to music until I was 14 years old. I didn't even watch TV ever. I'd read supper real quick, and I'd go outside, and I'd just master those crafts. of and maybe put myself in my own world, maybe like a self-therapy thing. But uh, uh, that one day when I was 14, halfway through the summer, my, my dad walked into my room, and he says, I'm uprooting our family from beautiful, beautiful Southern California. Uh, well, I had an ideal, decent ideal of childhood. I really, really enjoyed it. And we're moving to the hot desert of Arizona. And I was like, what? At 14? Like high school? So when he left the room, the story I told myself was, I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. And my dad doesn't love me. Because how could he have ripped me from my community of sports and my community of friends? That's where I found my solitude with, with my running mates. You know, we had a great childhood. So uh, it, it was very, very uh, like, a, like a culture shock, like a, like a big shock in my life, like the call to action to my story. So when I reluctantly left all my friends and moved to the hot desert of Arizona, I decided at the moment it's time to become, an, to become even an overachiever, a bigger overachiever through yeah. athletics. Yeah. So in high school, uh, I actually became the number one soccer player in the state of Arizona. I loved soccer. Uh, it, was, it was pretty much easier than baseball. But my childhood dream was to play Major League Baseball, like I told you. Sure. So uh, I had, had no offers anywhere to play baseball out of high school, uh, nothing. But soccer, I had a chance to go play in Europe. I had a chance to go play at universities. I was pretty advanced in soccer, but I wanted to play Major League Baseball. So I walked on at the local community college, and the only reason I made the team is because of my work ethic. I was the first guy there, the last guy to leave every single day, and that's why I made the team. And that's where kind of like, you know, when you get into college, you kind of make that decision, like, I want to focus 100% on this. Yep. So like I said, when my, buddy, when my buddies are partying, I was working. Whenever they say it's too hot out here in Arizona, I was working. You know, uh, there's no such thing as tired. There's no such thing as sick. It's like you just master that craft. So I take pride in that aspect of I think a lot of successful people do is, is like it's in the work. It's in the process, super process oriented uh, with how I achieved the success I did because the uncluttered mind is systematic, right? So uh, uh, after three years of playing junior college baseball, I uh, became the number one baseball player in the junior college level in Arizona. 
And uh, the funny story, like we were talking when we were, we were talking earlier, uh, when we talked, you're, you're, you know, a Red Sox fan. So I get drafted by the tenth round by the Red Sox, and I proceed to tell everybody, all my friends and family, I got drafted by the White Sox. This is at 20 years old. I had no idea what team I got drafted by. That's because that, that that story that was driving me, that pain that was driving me. I just wanted to achieve that success. I wanted to go to the top. I wanted to be able to do so I could be somebody, so I could you know get noticed, especially yeah. from my father. So uh, uh, all my friends would say, "Man, what are you talking about? You didn't get drafted by." The, Red, the White Sox, he got drafted by the Red Sox, one of the most prestigious teams. Ted Williams, Kyle Yastrzemski, like all these guys. You don't know who that is? So I always had two answers. I'd always tell everybody, hey, y'all need to understand. I grew up a diehard Dodger fan in the 1980s, so I don't know anything about baseball outside of Chavez Ravine. Yeah. And number two, I don't care what socks it is. I'm going to the big leagues. So <laughs> when I reported in spring training, uh, uh, my first spring training season, minor league spring training, professional baseball, I'm one step closer of – of accomplishing that dream of being a coming major league baseball player. See, what happens is there's 3 million youth baseball players in the United States, yep. and only 0.05% of those get a chance to get drafted, to get a chance to play professional. And I was so gracious and fortunate enough to be one of those guys, and I'm hitting extra after one of my workouts. Uh, we had a workout every single day for spring training for the minor leagues, just getting acclimated, and the minor league director came over to me, and he said, hey, son, come here, i got to talk to you. And I said, oh, my gosh, what happened? What did I do? I just got here. I'm just really realizing what team I'm playing for, the Red Sox. And uh, the reason why I say that is because every team I was on as a kid, I got kicked off of. I got kicked off my junior high team. I got kicked off my high school team. I got kicked off my junior college team. And I had controversy all the way through with <laughs> authoritative figures to the minor leagues and the major leagues yeah. because of that story I told myself. I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. My dad doesn't love me. So what we, don't, what we need to realize is that so many times those experiences that we experience at such a young age, how we interpret those experiences and communicate those in our minds is going to dictate and discern how our belief system is formed and how we're going to engage in future experiences. So every time I got into an authoritative figure situation, I thought, like, what do I do now? Like, I can't handle this. I'm not prepared for this. I don't, I'm not equipped. I don't know how to communicate. I want to tell everybody, like, zip it. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't like you uh, because all I had to do is swing it back. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, the minor league director came over to me and he said, hey, uh, you have all the makings to become a major league baseball player mm -hmm. and make millions and millions of dollars in the major leagues. And that's like the second point that I like to talk on with people, because there's a lot of people out there right now, especially with COVID, that are stuck. That they yeah. have to do a life transition. That I don't know what to do. My life is going good. Now it's going bad. I don't know where I'm at. I don't have these skill sets. So what it is is like, what I teach people is if you want to go to accomplish something, if you want to go engage and, and achieve something, you have to find someone like you that's been there and done that. That's yeah. step number one. So if my only director has been there and done that, and he tells me, hey. Uh, you have all the makings to make it and, and make millions of dollars. And that's what I was trying to achieve my whole life. Step number two, you have to have that person that's been there, done it, lay out a plan for you. So I asked him, I said, hey, what do I need to do? I was so great at it. Like I said, I really didn't realize what team I was playing for as a professional player. I was like, tell me what to do and I'll do it. So he laid out this plan for me. And over the next five years of the minor league, my, my minor league career, the next five years, uh, I implemented that plan. So that's step number three. And it's the most difficult step for so many people is they don't know how to implement it. They don't have that grit. They don't have that why that's strong enough. They don't have that understanding of what they're trying to achieve and smell it and understand how to go get it. So uh, that's what people lack is in the third step that I say is they don't know how to implement it. You've got to implement it and you've got to take massive action like Tony Robbins says. And then you have to have sensory acuity to learn out what makes, what works and what doesn't work and what's going on and what's not going on. So over the next five years, uh, my minor league career, I had player of the year three of the five years. Mind you, like five years before this, like I walked on at the junior college. So I wasn't better than anybody else, but man, I was hungry. I had that passion. I'm like, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do everything I can to get there because yep. that story I told myself. So with that being said, I got my shot to play Major League Baseball. In 2001, after my fifth year, I was just getting ready to go catch, be a catcher at Triple A for the Red Sox in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. I right. thought I was going to be a starting catcher. I go to big league spring training as a, uh, uh, like that towel boy, uh, yeah. catching, catching bullpens, all that stuff. But I got a chance through opportunities, but I was always prepared. You have to be prepared. You, I, I, can't, I can't stress that enough. Preparation yeah. process is, is where it's at. I want, to, I want to unpack that because it's so true. You know, as, as a person, 
that's never played, you know, at that level. You know, I just assumed, okay, you know, the Red Sox, they've got a game. The game starts at 7. So, you know, the guys are probably showing up there at the stadium, you know, 536. You know, they're I wish. Out, they, they run out the damn door onto the field. And what I learned is like, shit, you guys show up at like 1130, 12 o'clock for like a 7 p.m. game because there's so much preparation. There's the stretching. There's the coaching. There's there's the team getting together. You know, there's some guys are getting stretched. Some guys are sitting in the hot tub. Some guys are, you know, doing other stuff. And, you know, what was really amazing to me is the level of preparation, literally six to seven hours before the game. And that's on top of the 10,000 hours that dudes like you have already put in getting to that level, right? They talk about the concept of 10,000 hours to mastery mm -hmm. where – People like, you know, uh, Tiger Woods or people like, you know, Michael Jordan have literally practiced that free throw or practiced that putt 10,000 times so that when there's thousands of people with all the energy and all the noise, it's like they can just close their eyes and boop, swish, right? Not even have to think about it. It's almost human nature. But the funny thing is that most people that never play professional sports of any kind don't understand the commitment. It's the habits, it's showing up early. And I always tell people half the success in business is just showing up, right? I mean, how many times for you have you made an appointment with somebody and either they don't show up or they do show up, but they're like 30, 45 minutes late for whatever reason, half the battle to being successful in anything in life is you just got to show up, but you got to have the commitment to also show up early, put in the work you know, have the discipline. One thing that I want to ask you about just out of curiosity is when you were playing at that level and you finally realized who all these people were, you know, like Yastrzemski and everything else, did you ever feel intimidated as a player that you weren't of the same caliber as some of the people either that were on the same team or perhaps were on competing teams? Was there ever that attitude going in that, man, I don't know if I can live up to these superstars that I'm competing with? I love that you said that. That's a, that's a, that, that gets me like I want to jump to the screen right now because no one's ever asked <laughs> it, no, one, no one's ever asked me that before. And this is what it's at. Like there's different levels to your success. Yes. Everybody has to start out at level one. Doesn't matter what it is. Like I'm starting out level one now. I've been in real estate for a little bit. I'm doing the podcasting. I'm doing the influencer stuff. Uh, I love coaching. I love teaching. I love sharing my passion because my passion is driving my love now, not that pain before that sent me into a bad spot. So what it is is that I operated at a level seven in the major leagues, mm -hmm. and that, that, that was my ceiling. Like, I wasn't really that good. I was a two-time all-star third baseman, and I had no clue how to field a ground ball. I'm, like, the worst infielder in the world, but I knew how to implement a process. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a four-step process for me to field a ground ball that I focused on when I trained. Because everything's in the training. Everything's sure. in the process. Everything's in the preparation. I read the ground ball for speed, location, hop. I set up for the ground ball. I pick it. I go right, left, to take a step foot, step with my right foot, step with my left foot, pick up my target throw. Read the ground ball, pick it, right, left, pick, right, left, pick up your target throw. Read the ground ball, pick it, right, left, pick up your target. Like over and over and over. Like I said earlier, the, the uncluttered mind is systematic. So many people have generalization, generalized thoughts all the time, and they're all over the place. And generalization, especially with technology, everything's fast-paced, everything's getting thrown at us. We don't know how to operate. We don't know how to function. But I'll yeah. teach you how to hit, and I'll teach you how to perform in front of 50,000 people every single night. This is how we do it. You have to have a specific focus on what you're trying to work on, what you're, what you're set up to achieve. If you have a specific focus, you're going to be in the moment, and you implement a process or a system that you customize yourself. You have someone create something or whatever, but you customize it to yourself of how you think and how you operate. And then once you do that, you're ingraining that into your nervous system, and then it becomes second nature, like you said. Then it becomes like you know, just go out there and do it. So what it is, is like I was performing at, I say, a level seven against guys that are level 10, 11, and 12. I hit in front of Barry Bond. I hit in front of Manny Ramirez. I, hit the, I play with these guys the side by side with Nomar Garcia Parra. I mean, Randy John, like guys are the best, but I never competed against them because I always prepared. There's so many guys in the clubhouse that are there, but they don't know how to sustain it. They obtain it, but they don't know how to sustain it because – they don't know how to focus. You got to, like Michael Jordan says, right? Like all this stuff sounds cliche, but we all do the same thing. I always competed against the best version of myself. I knew what I was capable of doing yeah. because I worked at it. Like I've swung a baseball bat a million times. Think yeah. about that. Sure. I'd be an idiot if I couldn't hit a major league fastball. Like, I, I, not, like retard, like, the, not, like, don't, like, 
whatever. So uh, I've swung a bet in a betting cage 60,000 times in the off season. There's no off season. We take three weeks off, and then for the next three and a half months, we're, we're training six, seven, eight hours a day. And then during the season, you have spring training for five weeks. And then after that, you have a six-month season to where you're playing every single day. So it's like your mind, you've got to train. Yeah. But what, I, what, what I've seen that's happened to so many people is that they don't train the inside. They don't know who they are. Because you have to be obsessed with what you're doing to, to, to perform at that level. Yeah. And when you become obsessed, it becomes your identity of who you are. And that's where it gets very, very dangerous. It gets very, very clouded, and then you end up selling your soul, and you become disconnected from who you are, and you don't even know what makes you tick. And then after that, you're on the field. I had little girls in the stands holding up signs saying, will you marry me, Shay? I would do autograph signing for $10,000 an hour, and girls would come to the table crying and shaking just because they got to meet me. How do you process that right. when you're disconnected from the inside, when you don't know who you are, and that pain in your life of what you've been going through, you don't know how to navigate that, uh, that pain, uh, it's driving you. So I would be playing the pain-driven game, and it just, it's very toxic. Mm -hmm. But to get back on what I was talking about with the levels – uh, you start at level one. So when I went to, went to spring training, I level one. This is what I do. And once you understand how to master level one, you go to level two. And then once you learn how to master level two, you stay there. I know I want to perform in the major leagues. I know I want to perform on top of the world. I, I want to perform at the level 10 level. I don't know how high I can go. But once I master level two, I can't think about level three, level four, level five, level six. I can't think about... I, I could never do what Barry Bonds says. I could never do what Albert Pujols says. I could never do what Big Poppy, what Manny. Now you're close. Like, it, they're, they're superhuman what these guys can do. <laughs> I know if I perform to the biggest, most potential of myself, I know I can compete. And that's where it is. Well, the yeah. one thing, real, real quick, the one thing that every major leaguer has in common, the one thing that every successful person has in common, whether it's a CEO, a millionaire, a billionaire, whoever it is, uh, most successful entrepreneurs like you were talking about uh, before we got on the podcast, the one thing we all have in common is that we know if we get an opportunity to do it, we believe we could do it. You have to believe in yourself. And so how does that work? How do you believe in yourself? Yeah. So a lot of people don't really understand how to believe in themselves. So there's a simple formula that I kind of created to get people to start. Because the biggest thing that we have to struggle, struggle with is starting because there's limited belief. All that BS. You're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be good. You can't do this. You can't do that. What are you talking about? Because our mind is trying to keep us in our comfort zone. But the one thing that's super simple that we could, I would like to convey to your listeners is that in order to believe in something, to where I believe that if I implement this system or this process of whatever skill set or whatever I'm trying to achieve, I believe that if I implement this thing right here, that I can achieve what I'm trying to achieve. It's right. as simple as that. That's how you start the foundation of belief. Uh, whether it's YouTubing, like I'm trying to figure out whether it's real estate, whatever. I believe that if I implement this system right here every single day and go at it, and fail and refine and fail and refine, I believe that I will achieve what I've set out to do. Yep. Well, you know, the thing that I got out of that, which I think is also very important, is the preparation. I'll give you an example. So many people are invited to speak. And so they're like, sure, I'll show up. And what they do is they show up. Mm -hmm. They don't spend two weeks before the damn event rehearsing, getting a script, videotaping. I mean, if you're going to play at the major leagues or if you're going to be a keynote speaker, dude, you got to plan for success. You don't just say, sure, I'll be there and then walk out on the stage and deliver what's going to get you a standing ovation. Most people don't understand it's the preparation before the big event, right? You've got to play every day as if tomorrow is the World Series. I tell people, there's no plan B in life because the second you make up your mind there's a plan B, you've already given up on your plan A, right? If you ain't committed to your plan A 100%, what the hell are you thinking about a plan B for? And so I tell people, it's the preparation for success. You've got to be practicing every single day because like you said, you never really compared yourself to the Barry Bonds or to the guys that were, quote, the elite superstars because you were putting forth 100% of your best. And as long as you give 100% of your best, you're playing at your highest level. Because let's face it, you know, as a coach, I'm looking out at the coaching industry and who do I see? I see Tony Robbins, you know, I see Brian Tracy, I see Grant Cardone, and I'm like, is Brad Blazer good enough to ever compete at that level? Well, if I give it my all and I'm preparing every day and I'm making the right connections, my thought is, yeah, in three to five years, I'll be on stages in front of 10 to 20,000 people because I'm already putting those things in motion. I'm doing the things I need to be doing to get there, just like you did. 
when you in your mind saw yourself as a major league baseball player. It's the vision and it's doing it every day. When I started, my wife looked at me and she said, how much longer are you going to do this before you give up? You know, you weren't born a coach. And I'm like, I'm never giving up. I don't care if I have to spend another hundred thousand dollars to hire people and to get on the phone and do more podcasts. This is my vision. This is my goal. This is where I want to be in the next three to five years. And I've made so much progress just in the last year from where I started to where I am today, you know, talking to like Deepak Chopra's business partner, you know, talking to people like Brandon Dawson tonight, you know, uh, interviewing on my show, you know, Matthew Knowles, his daughter's a billionaire and everybody in the world knows who Beyonce is. It's all about just setting shit in motion. And then once you do, man, it's just relentless. It's like every day, show up every day, get better every day, keep pushing yourself. What I tell people, which is so funny, is we as humans, I believe, operate in three zones. And unfortunately, for like 99% of the people, everybody operates in the center zone, which is the comfort zone, right? We're creatures of comfort. We're lazy. When shit gets hard, we retreat, right? We hope that it will end. Then beyond that is what I call the stretch zone. That's where you got to get outside of your comfort zone. That's where real growth in a person develops. That's when a coach is pushing you because I believe that a good coach gets you to do something tomorrow that you can't do today, right? Let's face it. When you were playing baseball, your coaches were coaching you to become better so that in six months you could play better than you did when you started. Then mm -hmm. beyond that stretch zone is the holy shit. This is the panic zone. <laughs> and I believe everybody needs to get in that panic zone every now and then because that's where you really start making dramatic leaps because once you accomplish something, your confidence level just goes through the roof. As an example, if I said to myself, I want to go out and run a marathon and I've never ran, I can't even run three miles. The idea of me doing that is like, holy shit, I can't do that. But if I start jogging every day and then I enter a 5k and maybe I do one more, then I enter a 10k, 6.2 miles. I do that. Then I do a half marathon, 13 miles. I do that. When I accomplish those goals, it reinforces my belief. Then when I finally say, okay, I've ran three or four half marathons, let me go enter my full marathon. And I do that. My confidence level now is way up here as an athlete, because I realize I can pretty much roll out of bed any day of the week and go run 10 miles. You know, my, my fitness is at that level. And that's where, you know, I've been. And of course I'm a triathlete, but so many people don't understand playing at that level, being professional in anything you do, and having that championship mindset is all about the preparation before you even show up to perform, right? CEOs know that. Elite athletes know that. It's in the preparation, quote, up to actually walking out on the stage. For you, the stage, of course, is center field, right, inside the stadium. Or it's making it to the World Series. Now, the one thing that I want to just quickly touch upon, which I thought was also uh, a big part of your story, is the dynamic, of course, between, you know, you and your father and not really feeling, you know, that you were loved or that, you know, you really, I won't say earn his respect, but you were constantly competing for that because I think that is a big part of the life of a lot of men. It's that just reality. Um, you also mentioned that you had a love for soccer. And, you know, I don't know if the soccer season overlaps the baseball season, but there are a lot of players, and I think actually Bonds was one, that actually played two sports and played two sports fairly well. Did that thought ever enter your mind? I mean, do the two seasons, are they separate where you could have played some soccer and then you could have played baseball or did you just never really want to go down the soccer path? Uh, you know, after high school, you want to delegate yourself to one specific sport. If you're trying to achieve that ultimate success, so you can focus on that and channel that and not have any distractions. I really didn't have any ambition to go anywhere after high school with soccer. Actually, soccer is a winter sport in spring, uh, summer uh, uh, Baseball is a spring sport out here in Arizona, so they just kind of overlapped a little bit uh, to tell in the soccer season. Uh, but uh, the biggest thing, like you said, is with my father, is that uh, I didn't know how to communicate that, uh, what I needed or whatever. My father, it's like a generational curse that we had. My father had the same relationship with his dad. He was never good enough. Uh, he was he, you know, empty, stuff like that. So once I made the major leagues, once I made the, you know, 2001, I'm on a major league baseball field and I have like tears coming out of my face on opening day in Baltimore. I'm like, dude, I'm here. I did it. Like yeah. I, I accomplished this, but I had this internal conflict, this internal turmoil going on inside myself with that pain of me being disconnected from who I was because I didn't know how to process that and understand how to communicate that and work with that because I was so obsessed with uh, playing major league baseball that sure. All I was trying to achieve for that process of all the success is get my dad's approval. 
But uh, you know, over over seven years, uh, I had uh, you know very memorable years of baseball. A lot of highlights. Um, the first guy, the Red Sox player, to hit a game-winning home run off Mariano, Mariano Rivera at Fenway Park. Two All-Star games, been in perfect games. All yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I've been there, done that, made millions and millions of dollars, and I, I just really had that disconnect. I didn't know how to, and that's what happens at the highest level with successful people. Uh, I believe is that if they don't know how to have that team around them to be able to understand how to process through what they're going through, that uh, you disconnect. You disconnect yeah. from who you are. I had to disconnect from who I was on a nightly basis because if I didn't disconnect, all that emotion, all that pain, all that, all that stuff I was going through would be a distraction. Because baseball is every single night. And that's what, that's what fueled the confrontation that I had while I was playing Major League Baseball. I'm like, I'm passionate and I'm the most loving person that I know that like I would give the shit off my back. I would die for my family. Like, like I, without a doubt, like I have such a servant's heart, but that wasn't conveyed because that pain I had inside myself and that pain I had to cover up. And the way I, I learned how to cover that up through survival techniques was to kind of be an a-hole to people, to keep right. people at arm's distance away. So when you disconnect from who you are, you, you, you can't show love. You can't show gratitude. If I'm angry, I disconnect. If I'm happy, I disconnect because that's just where it is at that level, and it's so toxic. I had created, uh, you know, survival characteristic flaws in my character, uh, driven by that pain because of how I interpreted experiences and communicated those to myself, and then uh, I disconnected from where I was. Rather than having somebody help me, walk me through, like, dude, like, you have some characteristic flaws that are cool. We all have, no one, no one ever around me would help me process through that because I was treated like a god, and everybody was intimidated by me because, and, and as an athlete, you know, you don't understand what I'm going through, you don't get it. Like I was always there with my family. I have three beautiful adopted children. Uh, I'm, I'm recently remarried and have two uh, uh, stepchildren, stepdaughters as well, so I have five kids, yeah. and uh, I was always with my kids. I spent millions of dollars in plane flights and private flights, all this stuff to be there, but I was never there present with them because yeah. I was always obsessed of worrying about riding and dying as an identity of a major league baseball player. So when it becomes your identity, it becomes very scary because one day that identity is going to be stripped from you. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's, the other question I want to ask you is at that level where you're competing and you always quote, know that you have to be at your best, you know, because if you're not playing at your best, obviously you get traded to another team or, you know, you get kicked off. But the question I have, because we've heard so much of this in professional sports and, you know, you played, of course, many years ago, were steroids a big part of the game back when you were a player? Did you see a lot of that in the locker room or did you know that a lot of the other players were actually using roids to, you know, amp up their skills and, you know, play at a higher level? Yeah, I'll, uh, I just, you know, whatever happens in the clubhouse stays there. Yeah, uh, that's it's like one of those Vegas, things right? where happens in Vegas, like, stays in Vegas. But. Yeah, as, as a 30,000, you know, foot level uh, outside perspective uh, to, to let somebody in inside because I know so much stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, the steroids weren't illegal then. I mean, yeah. it, obviously people know. Uh, you could see uh, players, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it was there. Okay, yeah, I mean, I figured it was because obviously it's in most sports, you know, it's hidden and it's kind of, uh, you know, under the table. And I'm sure that, you know, over the years, of course, it's, it's evolved. And of course, you know, now, of course, they're, they're, I guess, you know, illegal or you're not supposed to use them. Um, the other question, I guess, also is you touched upon beliefs. And I, I, of course, you know, have a trademark philosophy, which is the art of beliefology. It's changing your belief system, really re-engineering the mind. So many people don't know how to do that. And when you were growing up, were there a lot of naysayers? Were there a lot of people saying, are you crazy, Shay? You're never going to play in the major leagues. Or were there people that were naysayers that were trying to, what I call, you know, pull you back, hold you back? Because what I've learned as I've been around a lot of big successful people is we don't even listen to our feelings. It's like we have the ability to block out all the bullshit and all the noise. And one thing I've learned as an entrepreneur, even when I was building my oil company, because when I told my parents I was dropping out of college to start a business, like, are you fucking the idiot? What do you know about running a company? You're not even a fucking business major studying architecture. I just said, I don't give a shit, I'm doing it. You know, and I went yeah. and I did it and I proved them wrong. Because the, 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 the process of becoming an entrepreneur is really a very lonely journey until you find success. <laughs> then your biggest naysayers become your biggest advocates because they're like, holy shit, look at him today. He's where he said he was going to be. But getting there is a pain in the ass because you've got a lot of bullshit, you know, that you're, you're going like this to pushing people away saying, no, let me prove you're wrong. Now, personally, I use that as fuel. It's like, dude, <laughs> you don't know who you're fucking talking to. You're talking to the guy that builds beasts. But when you were trying to get where you wanted to be, 
Did you have to deal with a lot of that in your own personal life? Were there people that were naysayers or people that were trying to hold you back? And how did you keep focused? Absolutely. I mean, it happens ever. It happens today. Yeah, so when you, when you when you when you when you first said that, I started smiling because I'm, I'm dealing with it right now. And, and, it, and it's it, the, the most challenging part is the people that are the closest to you that that kind of have a simple mindset. Like you have to like I'm batshit crazy. Like 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 it's, it's just though, is is what most people fear is the judgment of other people. It's the people that you're closest to. You fear their judgment. And that's what holds most people back. It's not the fear of doing something. It's not the fear of failure. The fear most people experience is, what are my parents going to think? What are my closest friends going to think? What's my wife going to think? And so what I always tell the people I coach is, the biggest fear you have is the judgment of other people. And once you realize that, don't give a shit about what other people think. You got to focus on yourself. Then, boom, it's like the world becomes your oyster and you're able to move forward. And so I always tell people, don't give a shit about what other people think, because it's really the judgment of others, you know, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you were saying oh, something yeah. before. You, you, you're right. And the, the thing is, is like, when you're saying that, like, like, you want to get to that point where you don't care what other people think. But what we need to understand is like, why do you care about other people's opinion? We, what we want is that love from people. We want people to love us. That's just a natural uh, subconscious level understanding of, of why you fear other people's opinion. You want to be accepted. You want to be accepted where you're at. So what happens is in order to get to that point to where you don't care what other people think, you have to love yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have to self-love and you have to take care of yourself. And Oprah says it's best. You know what I mean? Like just, you're in charge of throwing yourself up and keeping yourself full. But the problem with men, especially after 35, to change a belief system after 35 as a man is almost impossible, especially from somebody who's been on top of the world like myself, who's treated like a god for, for that ridiculous belief system that I had before to, to be able to change it. Like, I recreated my whole belief system. I had to go through my story, go through the understanding of why, what led me to where I was going, that story I was telling myself, because if you say something to yourself, I'll constantly get to your subconscious mind, and that's what's going to be able to drive you in your belief system. It's insane of what happens. So what happens is you got to self-love yourself and you got to fill yourself up, but it's so hard for men to do because we got pride, we have ego, and we got to provide for our family. We got, like, there's so much, bro, I can't tell you how many times after, I mean, I was very fortunate to be one of the very few that accomplished both my childhood dreams. I, I wanted to play Major League Baseball and, and own a zoo. Play Major League Baseball and own a zoo, and I did both that. Yep. So, uh, so many people, uh, so they don't work on themselves. Like you have to invest in yourself. That's the biggest investment that you'll ever make. And I drove around so many times after being on top of the world and losing everything. Like, what's the purpose of life? Like, what, like, what is this? Like I've done everything that uh, everybody always envisioned. Everybody always wanted. I've done it. And it's like meaningless. Like it's, it's, it's empty. The private jets, the mansions, the cars, the money, everything, the relationships, they, they're all that. it's meaningless because I didn't know how to have a relationship with myself. And that started with the story that I told myself that I wasn't worthy of that because of the experiences that I had from a very young age. So what I touch on, what I'm very passionate about is that I want to help people rewrite their stories. And like Ed, my, Ed, Ed Milet says this all the time. If I am the same person I am today than I was a year ago, then I'm doing myself a disservice and everybody else that I come across. Like you constantly got to be progression. The key to happiness is progression. You got to constantly be evolving in that fullest version of yourself. But if you don't have any self-identity, self-understanding of what your fullest version of yourself is because life's kicked you in the ass because of circumstances, because of situations, because if you've, been, you've got knocked down your butt or you've been had, had a setback or, or failures or whatever. Like, it's like, we all do that. Like, life kicks you in the tail regardless of who you are. If you have to take a step back, a setback or whatever, like, like I made $18 million and six years ago, I was sleeping in a van. You know how humiliating that is when you're, you're scrounged up change out of a cup holder of your van that you're living in after being on top of the world and, and, and trying to feed your kids Little Caesars pizza just to feed them. Hmm. While the kids are going, my kids are going to school telling all their friends, oh, my dad played for the Arizona Diamondbacks. How do you process that? How do you deal with that as a man and not let that affect you? So that ultimately drove me to a spot that, that I was one breath away from dying. And I was one breath away because I was trying to numb that pain because of what I went through. And I didn't really think that anybody could ever understand what I was going through. And I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed of, of being able to, to go through the stuff that I went through that what would people think of me? Like, here, I'm a guy. Here, I did all this stuff. And, like, I can't show any weakness. I can't show. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is ask somebody for help. 
Because I was helping everybody. I'd give it away a million dollars to help people. I mean, I'd buy people houses, buy people cars, but I couldn't take care of myself. So the only thing that comes out of this podcast with Shea Hoyman, you've got to understand who you are. You've got to understand your identity to step into the fullest version of yourself. What's jamming up your identity and you stepping into the fullest version of yourself is that bullshit story you tell yourself on a daily basis that's chock full of limited beliefs. That's what's crazy. So I have a four-step formula to be able to discover your story and tell your story so you can create a brand and message so you go out there, create your brand, and you can monetize it, whatever it is. But what I didn't realize is that I thought my gifts and talents were playing Major League Baseball, hitting fastballs, knowing how to hit a curveball, performing in front of millions of people. That's the stuff that I could do, but my gifts and talents lies within speaking life into people, having my passion motivate people, having my understanding of helping people go to the pit hells of their life. Yep. And what I realized that I had that gift and talent was when I discovered my story. What, what led me to where I ultimately was at that point in time, being one breath away from losing my life in the Florida van after overdosing on drugs and alcohol. Once you discover that gift, I believe everybody's been given a gift. Everybody has a gift inside them. And that one gift that we've been given to, whatever it is, it's our duty to help other people solve their problems. Really That's what it's about. And, and, and when you solve somebody else's problem, you can monetize that, but you can't monetize bullshit. And so many guys out there trying to monetize bullshit, trying to fluff and trying to do service level stuff. They, they're going through these, uh, whatever it's YouTube or, or these programs, and like, they, they don't understand who they are. Like I did, I'm telling you God's honest truth. This is the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing in, in the world. I couldn't even, I was, I, I had the third highest active batting average at Yankee Stadium, like behind Paul Konerko, Ichiro, Shane Hillenberg. I had the best, third best batting average on the biggest stage in baseball, there's 50,000 fans. I can wait because I know how to work. I know how to create a process. I know how to implement that stuff. But I'd have a big game. I had a game-winning home run off Mike Messina or whatever. I'd be at ESPN highlights after the game, and I'd be in a five-star restaurant with some friends or family. Yeah, yeah. And I'd be sitting at the table at this restaurant after performing on the biggest stage in baseball, and I couldn't get up from my supper table to go across the restaurant to use the restroom, I can't tell you how many times I almost peed my pants in fear of people staring at me because I had no self-worth, wow. no self-identity off the baseball field. So why do I say that? Like, this is the guy. Like, that before is a character in my story, and, and I was so ashamed of that so many times. I told Dee Epstein, I mean, explicit this on the radio. I've told the third, I, I've done so many things in a clubhouse that's, like, so toxic. I was deemed the cancer in the clubhouse. I was deemed the, the toxic player, the asshole. And it's like, dude, that's a byproduct of my belief system, of character flaws, because of that pain, because of that story. And everybody goes through that. Not many people can relate to a two-time Major League Baseball All-Star. But a lot of people can relate to, as I'm laying on the floor of a van, right there motionless, yep. after, after losing everything in my life, yep. and after overdosing on drugs and alcohol, here lies a guy that's so many envy. Mm -hmm. And as the soul's leaving the top of my head, and then clinging onto my last breath, the thoughts go through my mind. Because that pain, I was just trying to numb the pain. Yep. You lost everything. You're a failure. What would your parents think if you left this world today? What kind of dad would do this to his kids? Are you freaking kidding me, Shay? All the stuff that you've had on top of the world, you've lost everything, you've done this stuff. And my answer to that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because I'm nothing if I don't have baseball. And I was tired of fighting that pain-driven game. Yep. So I let go. I, I didn't know what to do anymore. I let go. It becomes so overwhelming to people that I just, I, I just let go. Yep. I don't know if I died or if I fell asleep. Well, I mean, but, it's tough. I, because, you know, I was a young kid in my 20s, and I built a multi-million dollar oil company. I mean, I was driving around in Porsches, living in nice houses, you know, I mean, I was living the high life and I thought I was indestructible. And then of course the shit hit the fan and you're like, holy crap, here I was, you know, making hundreds of thousands, raising millions of dollars, having all of these things. And now it's like you said, I'm fucking scrounging for quarters to do my laundry. And it's tough to deal with that. Now I always believe that it's in the bounce back. It's in reinventing yourself. It's in, you know, understanding your primary skills. And so I want to ask you, you know, what's chapter two, for Shea Hillebrand, you know, I know what you're doing now, but I believe that there's a much bigger chapter in your life as you look forward. Obviously, I know that you're in real estate, but what's what's chapter two or what would you like chapter two to be for you? Let's just say over the next, you know, three to seven years. I think uh, I think I might be on chapter 22. 
<laughs> and you only got one of the dudes up here on your hat. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, this is voice to the voice list. Two V's apparel. I got a apparel line because uh, I want to inspire people to use their voice and find their voice, which is their identity, your skills, your talents, your purpose, and utilize that to impact the world and use their voice to help other people find their voice. No better time to do that than right now. But right. Uh, I, I think what you're saying when you're talking about, uh, you know, a lot of people have had success and have lost everything, and, and, and you go through this process of this evolution of yourself. But I know for myself, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change one thing that happened in my life. And there's a lot of things that I'm embarrassed of that I was. I'm, I'm not now because I understand why I did those things so I could process it and I can explain it. Like, I get hate all the time now. Like, you're a cancer of the team. You're this and that. I'm like, no, I'm not. That I was, yeah. But let me explain to you why I was that. And maybe I can help you through that process. But what I loved about going through hell and going through the pit of hell of my life of losing everything one breath away, I had nothing else I could focus on. I had no distractions. See, what happened is money distracts. The fame distracts the bull crap in your life. I had all that stripped, and all I could focus on is myself. Mm -hmm. And when I was able to focus on myself, and I had to focus on myself, I just went to town. I went over this 12-year span of, like, personal development. I got a Ph.D. in this stuff, man. And then being able to figure it out, <laughs> just to find happiness and fulfillment like everybody else. Yeah. So, so right now, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, whatever it is, like, I got to speak. I got to get on stages. Uh, I, that, that's, that's where I get my competitive niche. That's where it's like, like my gift is being able to discern and be able to say things and be able to process and be able to, like I have quick processors. That's why I was able to hit a fastball so quick. It's like I could process information super quick. So I love helping, holding people's hands and going to those parts of the inner parts of who they are that they can't go on their own. Because a lot of places as us as men, we got, we got so much baggage packed up in there that it doesn't matter. And that's one thing that, like, uh, Grant Cardone says is, like, I kind of conflict with. He's like, you got to let that pain drive you. you got to allow that pain to use you. you got to, yeah, you have to do that. But if you don't understand where that pain came from and what that pain is, it's going to be toxic. It's not sustainable. You're not going to be the fullest version of yourself until yep. you really be authentic. And, what, like, I'm one of the only Major League Baseball players that I know that, that I'm fully transparent. I'm fully authentic. I'm fully like, dude, I effed everything up. I've been through so much crap. Everything that, that, that I've failed at in my life, I like to blame everybody else, but it was because of me. Decisions mm -hmm. I made because of my belief system. And because what drives your decisions is what you believe in, your beliefs and your values. Like my values and my beliefs were like not existent because my belief was that I'm going to play major league baseball. I don't care how I get there. I don't care what I'm going to do. I'm going to get there. If I got to step on somebody's throat, if I got to leave friends behind, if I got to like, like I cut my parents out of my whole career. Get this. I'm flying to the all-star game in 2005, Detroit, Michigan. I'm flying in a citation 10 jet, the fastest civilian jet in the world. I'm going 640 miles an hour and 64,000 feet. Like, imagine yourself, passion, pilot, co-pilot, yourself, multi-million dollar jet. I'm looking out the window, going to my childhood dream of playing Major League Baseball All-Star Game. I'm getting fixed, ready to play in front of millions and millions of people around the world. I look out the window. I can't see the ground. I'm so high. That's yeah. how pimping I am. Yeah. So what happens? Guess what's going through my mind? Mm -hmm. As I'm in this situation, I fucking hate myself. Wow. I hate everything about who I became because I'm not able to conquer from within. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to understand who I was. I was a person playing Major League Baseball, not a Major League Baseball player, and I didn't get that. And so many guys have lost their souls all along the way to have success. And the, the people that sustain success, that understand how to have fulfillment, uh, they understand who they are. They allow that, the, the team around them to help build them up. They, they, they expose their weaknesses, and they find people that, that, that they're weak in, the, the skill sets, and, and do what they need to do to, be able to elevate with the same vision. So I'm going to the all-star game, and I have my entourage there. I'm on the, on the field, like everywhere, in-laws, pimping it, big time. I'm all-star. I didn't even invite my parents. Yeah. My dad and my mom are sitting at the third deck of the stadium, humiliating themselves, talking to the fans, the security guards, uh, the officer, whoever it is, that's my son down there playing third base. And they're looking at them like, what are you talking about? If your son's playing third base, why are you up here? They're like, we don't know, but we love them. We love him and we support him so much. All the while, I'm on that field and I look up knowing my parents are up there. Yep. But I didn't even invite to the All-Star game. Wow. And I said, I fucking hate that guy. And that story was incorrect my whole life because when my dad moved us from California to Arizona, when he came into my room at 14 years old, 
and he said, we're moving the family. It was because to give me a chance to play Major League Baseball. My dad wanted to stay in Arizona or California. My family wanted to stay there. They sacrificed everything to give me a chance to be on that baseball field, and I cut my parents out of my whole career. I had toxic relationships my whole life. I couldn't know how to understand that because that pain that derived from that experience and that interpretation of that story and how I communicated that to myself, it's so crucial. It's so crucial, and so many people are doing it right now through everything that they're going through. How are you communicating to yourself? What's that story you're telling yourself? Let me help you rewrite it. What's the best way for the beast and everybody that's going to be seeing this around the world to uh, connect with you? Tell us about your website. What's the best way for people to, uh, to find you if they want to, you know, get coached or they want yeah. to talk about changing their beliefs? Yeah. The, the only website I have right now is for real estate because I do do real estate out here. Uh, but, but I do want to do the coaching. Uh, I am doing coaching with the mastermind, speaking yeah. engagement, stuff like that, helping people out. I'm on social, uh, Shay, Shay Hillenbrand on Facebook and then Shay underscore Hillenbrand on Instagram. And then LinkedIn, Shea Hillenbrand, uh, doing YouTube stuff, just uh, trying to spread my message, use my voice to help other people find their voice. Folks, once again, another great episode at Beast Nation. Shay, thanks so much, man. I just love your energy. I mean, I, I can just tell you're going to be successful as hell at anything you set your mind to just because you're a beast, man. You just got so much energy. Thanks so much for just uh, sharing literally just, I mean, golden nuggets, man. Just, you know, your, your mindset, your, your dedication. Uh, what it means to play at the highest level, be a champion, have the right beliefs. Again, folks, this is Brad Blazer. Stay tuned for our next episode of Beast Nation. Brad out.